Thank you so much for taking the opportunity to speak to us at Urban Times on behalf of our readership and the team. We'll get cracking, um, so we'll ask you about the London riots. Understanding the root causes is, is obviously a prominent topic of debate right now, especially with a formal inquiry being made into the issue. In your mind, what are the root causes for these spontaneous outbursts? You've got to look at various different uh, factors, and it wasn't uh, the same phenomenon everywhere in London. And clearly what happened in Tottenham initially on the Saturday night was a very different kind of thing from what you then saw elsewhere in the city on the Sunday and the Monday. So you, you initially had uh, a angry uh, bunch of people who were at the police station who had uh, grievances about the handling of a particular case, but even in, in Tottenham that rapidly changed into something very different and you had continuous looting and acquisitive crime uh, in that neighbourhood. And uh, that was really mimicked around London over the next couple of days. And what you had was a kind of mental contagion, if you like, as people picked up the idea that there was this incredible event going on, there was this mass lawlessness, and there was an opportunity to get your hands on free stuff. And I'm afraid lots of people who uh, either had criminal records or who were carried away in the heat of the moment uh, got involved in a completely crazy act of mindless uh, violence and, and criminality, and uh, that's how I, I would analyse it. And, and you know, I think to go into the the factors that led people to to behave like that, obviously, you know, there's going to be a a right wing analysis and a, and a left wing analysis, and the left wing analysis is going to say, well, it's all about poverty and, and deprivation and, and people not having things they they need to have, and. Uh, 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 the right-wing analysis might be that uh, it wasn't so much a question of, of, of poverty or cuts or, or whatever, but uh, people who were growing up without the right background, without the right self-restraint, who were bored, who didn't have uh, the right priorities in their lives, had uh, been tempted by what they saw on TV uh, to do terrible things that have got them into to lasting trouble. So that's a short kind of exposition of, of the causes of the, of, of the riots. It's not the end of the story. Whatever happens, we mustn't minimize the, the riots. They were a, a very, very important event for what they revealed. And they showed that there are large numbers, there's still a tiny minority, but nonetheless large numbers of people, not just young people, uh, who feel they can do that kind of thing. We have to deal with that, and you, you have to deal with it from a criminal justice point of view, from a policing point of view, you have a robust policing, and that was, I'm afraid, a factor of the spread of the rights, was that you know, people thought they could get away with it. The, the, the police did a brilliant job of containing it with robust British policing techniques, but you, know, you need to make sure that people fear the police, and uh, as the new Commissioner Bernard Hogan Howe is, is setting out to do, uh, he wants to, to restore that sense of of uh, instinctive uh, respect for authority that, that people, I think, should have when they see a, a London policeman. At Urban Times, we believe that the majority of antisocial behaviour stems from a lack of local activities that can constructively engage people, particularly London's youth. What is being done to offer solutions at a community level? Well, there are, of course, a huge number of uh, projects that we're supporting across the city and uh, people in areas like Tottenham or, or Croydon, wherever it happens to be, are, are engaged very, very heavily in trying to uh, divert young people from the kinds of choices that they're making. So you, you've got to work, you've got to deal with the gangs and you've got to have a policing response to the gangs, but you've also got to, got to have rival attractions, as it, as it were, and you've got to have things that people might want to do that are better. So one of the things that were sponsoring in the run-up to the Olympics is a pan-London initiative called Team London. And if you are an adult who wants to volunteer to help with uh, kids to become scouts or guides or cadets or whatever, you can do it through Team London. If you want to mentor young kids and some of the most difficult kids who are uh, most at risk of, of criminality, you can do it through Team London. If you're a young person 
who wants to help older people uh, and who wants to do something for the community, uh, help them with IT. Very much often, uh, young people know how to turn these things on. I, I, speaking personally, my kids can turn on my, com my TV, I can't. Uh, if, if you're a young person who wants to help older people, you can do it through Team London. If you, if you, if, if you want to improve parks, uh, gr use the growing spaces we're finding across London, the thousands of, of new places to grow uh, vegetables. You can do it through Team London. So Team London is a way of trying to bring people together in the run-up to the Olympics to, to harness people's desire to, uh, to cooperate and put something into their community. So if we move on now to the issue of going green, you've often mentioned this idea of putting the village back into the city. Uh, can you explain more about this idea? And other than your plans to plant more trees around London, what do you hope to do? My vision of London, it's a city that grew from about 156 villages. That's what it is. But fundamentally, at the core, you've got a high street, you've got a village, and what I would like to see is a, uh, there's a, there's a physical aspect to it. I want to see changes to urban realm that make the place more livable, more, more attractive to move around in. So that'll be schemes to create pedestrianized precincts so that you encourage people to shop, to take it easy, have a cup of coffee, all that kind of thing. That boosts um, shopping, it boosts the, the, the local high street. Uh, so it's, in, it's important uh, generator of economic activity. Put in trees, uh, as we've done, planted hundreds and hundreds of thousands of thousands of trees across uh, London. That also uh, improves the look and, and feel of it. Then you can change the atmosphere also in the way that you encourage people to, to move around. If you have a big increase in cycling as opposed to going by, by car, that again creates a village atmosphere. And cycling in London went up 15% last year. Never had such a big jump uh, in, in recent memory. And that's a, a good thing. Actually, and also, casualties went down. So you know, the, the motorists are, are definitely uh, responding, and the, the bus drivers and the taxi drivers are, are generally getting it right. So you can, you can do things like that. But you've also got to be proactive in trying to get people to know their neighbours. And so one of the things we've been very keen to do is to have more street parties, more fates, and it sounds corny, but actually it works. And if you encourage people to get out of their houses, out of their flats, sit down at a trestle table or whatever it happens to be on some day, the royal wedding or whatever, uh, we think that produces lasting benefits. All studies show where people know each other by their first name, in areas where people know each other by their first name or know their, each other's names, there is far less likely to be crime. And so it's a way of, of reducing crime. And crime is coming down overall in London, but putting the village back into the city is a way of bringing all those concepts together. Could you tell us more about the energy efficient systems that you hope to put in place before the London Olympics? And you've said that they will cut carbon emissions and reduce um, energy bills. How will these two come hand in hand? There's a, a, a big program called uh, Renew and Refit, uh, two big programs, one for uh, domestic, one for commercial properties. The big, the big way to reduce CO2 emissions is, is domestic uh, boilers uh, and, and commercial premises. I mean, most of, most of the uh, CO2 that a city produces, I mean, 70% roughly comes from buildings. And so what we're sh trying to show people is that if you put in lagging, it sounds incredibly, and people, people's eyes always glaze over. You mustn't glaze over while I talk about this. But if you, if you, if you insulate your home and you make it more, uh, you reduce your energy consumption, then you can save money and reduce uh, emissions. And what we've been trying to do is to get people to understand that. And uh, that this, this investment makes sense even in a time of economic difficulty. On the subject of budget, given uh, the Chancellor's commitment to fiscal tightening, do you think this will affect London's status as one of the world's preeminent cities? I hope not, and I don't think it will, because if you remember what happened uh, last year, we, we got a uh, very good settlement for transport, and were able to continue with massive investments in transport infrastructure, which are the bedrock of successful urban, uh, sustainable development because if you can move people cleanly and efficiently and as cheaply as possible from A to B in a city, uh, you will 
hugely improve uh, their quality of life and you will make it much, much easier to have uh, the kind of, uh, of development that we need. Uh, this, I just opened the Westfield uh, shopping center in, in Stratford. If you think about what that is, that would not, have, that's you know, 1.5 billion pounds worth of shopping center, 300 shops, 17 cinemas, uh, umpteen restaurants, a uh, massive generator of jobs for some of the poorest districts of London. Hmm? That would not have been possible without investment in the transport infrastructure, without the, the railway lines going into Stratford. The upgrade of the Jubilee line, the central line, the DLR extension, the, the, the three cars on the DLR as opposed to, uh, to two cars. Tra what I'm saying to you is transport leads in, in, a, in a sustainable city. Uh, mass transit is the beginning. If you look at the history of London, it was built on the expansion of the uh, of the railways and then the, the tube network and uh, now the, the biggest and most advanced uh, bus network in the world. What we want to do is to uh, keep going. The last thing you should do for a great city is stop investing in, in transport because that's, that's the beginning of successful urban development. Because you, I, I want to get people out of their cars onto, onto public transport or using green methods of, of getting around such as walking and cycling which as I say have also both increased. Just recently you've announced that transport costs in London might go up so high as 8%. Um, do you think that this is going to affect uh, people's ability to use public transport? All the evidence is that um, in spite of the recession, uh, the, and the, the incredible thing is how uh, much transport use continues to rise. On the buses, we're, we're doing well over two billion journeys a year now, which is, is more than it's ever been. Um, and on the tube, it's up to 1.1 billion journeys a year. And uh, there's no evidence at all of any, of any falling off. In, in spite of the recession, Londoners continue to travel more and more, and uh, bus travel in London remains considerably cheaper than anywhere else in the country, or, or most considerably cheaper than most other big cities. And there's a 24-hour freedom pass for older people, protection for the concessions for young people. People who are looking for jobs uh, have cut price travel and so do uh, war veterans. Do you have any words directly for our Urban Times readership? Yes, I do. I think that, um, I think that your ideas and the debate that you're trying to start is very important because what you're, you're doing is recognizing that there are problems but that in the end, humanity is an urban species, as I think um, Aristotle pointed out. And our problems can be solved by, in, by technological optimism and imagination in uh, urban policy and, and planning. And, and so we're always, we, are, we in, you know, it's a two-way process, we are all, always in the market for good new ideas.